Hello. So we're going to be talking about two very specific events of Japanese expansion um, during the period after World War II. Um, they're both they're kind of the ones that they focus on. There are some other examples, but these are really the most important ones. Um, they kind of lead Japan to align further with the um, Axis powers and things like that, and really bring um, the world to war. So a really important thing to note is that in a lot of cases, you can talk about World War II in Asia and World War II in Europe as very distinct conflict. In fact, the World War II in Asia begins in 37 and ends in 45, where World War I in Europe begins in uh, 39. Um, but they really aren't connected as a conflict until 1941 with the attack on Pearl Harbor. So let's get into these events um, that are, uh, are Japanese expansionism. The first event is called the Manchurian Crisis. Now, if you recall, we talked about how Manchuria was this region in northern China that Japan had economic interests in and had kind of been left kind of a regional, kind of a regional, uh, under a regional warlord's um, influence. So in Manchuria, there was a warlord who received funding and support by the Japanese government. However, um, Zhang Zhuolong, which, uh, gonna get, not great in the pronunciation there, I'm sorry, um, despite being backed by the Japanese government, begins operating in his own interests, okay? Um, ba based within Korea, specifically, which is a Japanese colony at the time, is a group called the Kwantung Army. Um, the Kwantung Army is kind of like paying attention to what's going on in Manchuria, but it, they are nominally, their job is to protect the Korean border um, from the instability in Japan. Um, so this army wa has, has historically wanted to be more involved in Manchuria, in fact, project Japan's influence in, in, uh, into Manchuria. And um, despite the fact that this warlord is kind of like doing his own thing, and the GMD, the, the Kuomintang, is trying to assert their control within Manchuria, eventually what the Kwantung army does is they block the movement of ne a Republic of China forces into Manchuria and assassinate this warlord. Um, and in response to the assassination by the Kwantung army. They're operating outside of the purview without the permission of the elected government of Japan. The prime minister of the time is a man named Tanaka. He wants to punish the Kwantung army for taking that action, specifically the, the commanding officers. However, the Japanese army does not want to let the civilian government exercise any oversight over them. And so they prevent the Kwantung army from being punished for violating the orders of the Japanese government. Um, later on, the Kwantung army fabricates an attack from the Kuomintang, and that allows them to, um, gives them a reason to invade and occupy Manchuria. The government of Japan orders them to stop. They do not, okay? And this is um, substantial for a few reasons. Uh, first, when Japan makes this outwardly aggressive action um, towards China, it indicates that Japan is willing to disrupt the established status quo that America and Great Britain are currently the beneficiaries of. Also, because Manchuria borders the uh, Soviet Union, this puts Chi uh, Japan more directly in conflict with the Soviet Union and also further aligns Japan with uh, anti-status quo forces, people who are critical of the established order, people like Adolf Hitler and Mussolini in Italy. Um, the GMD, which remember, is very much a limited force within China. Um, like they have a, re they kind of assert only regional control over the region, regional control over the region. Oh my God. 
uh, only assert nominal control over the country, um, they are forced to give up Manchuria and uh, 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 kind of accede that territory. But as a consequence of Japan invading what many Chinese people believe to be a part of China, more people begin to rally around the GMD. And so China becomes more unified as a consequence of the Kwantung Army's imposition into China. But also now that Japan controls Manchuria and its vast population and economic resources, the Japanese economy begins to make some progress and recover. And this makes the military's actions very popular with the Japanese populations and more popular than the civilian government at the time. So the military becomes even more influential going into the Manchurian crisis, going out of the Manchurian crisis. Okay. So Manchuria is this light orange territory in um, northern China. And notice that before the Manchurian crisis, the Japanese border with Russia is a very, very, very tiny part of the border with Korea. Now Japan borders a, a lot more of Russia, therefore feels more threatened by Russia, feels like it needs to take more drastic action maybe to protect itself, okay? Um, the next event is uh, the Sino-Japanese um, War, okay? So Manchuria is under Japanese control for the next six years. We're going to talk, talk about a little bit more about the international response to that in the next video. But over those six years, tensions between Amer uh, Japan and China do not decrease. That China still believes that Manchuria is illegally occupied. Uh, Japan has installed a puppet government led by the former Qing emperor uh, uh, known as Manchukuo. And um, in 1937, there is another event known as the Marco Polo Bridge Incident, in which a Japanese soldier goes missing um, for a period of time. He does not report for duty. The Japanese attempt to ask a, uh, the, a Japanese military installations, like bases in the area, have you seen this Japanese soldier? They're like, no. Then the Japanese are like, well, if they, uh, can we search your base for these soldiers? China's like, no, you cannot enter our military base as a foreign country that invaded us six years ago to search our bases, but we said we don't have this person who's missing. But because the Chinese are not willing to let them search, the Japanese view that as hostility. And from the hostility, declare war and attack China. The soldier that was missing is eventually found. He got lost. He wasn't ever attacked by the Chinese in the first place. So the war begins, um, and it is a full-out war. Where the Manchurian crisis was a very limited conflict. There wasn't a lot of back and forth. The Chinese military is kind of caught off guard. They're pushed out by the Kwantung army. This is a formal, conventional war between two countries in which both countries believe that it is of their existential need to fight the war. So this actually, you guys have been taught World War II several times at this point. This is the one of the fronts that has the greatest amount of violence among all the fronts of World War II. Millions of people die in the Sino-Japanese War. And in fact, you know, we don't say it's World War II until... 1939, that's more Eurocentric thing. It doesn't really become a global war until 1941. But half of the war, over half of the war in, this, in Asia is, is, has occurred by the time America joins the war in the, at the end of 1941. So uh, there are two kind of fronts of the war. You have the northern part in Manchuria, where the Japanese are pushing in, into central China from northern China. And then they attempt a invasion of southern China amphibiously along uh, the coast, starting at Shanghai. Um, Shanghai obviously matters a lot more to China. They invest a lot of resources in protecting it. It's a war of attrition in a lot of ways. That these countries are are shoveling resources towards both these fronts. It's immensely expensive for Japan to fight this war against China. Um, 
the Japanese engage in civilian bombing of the population. Uh, there is a very significant moment in the war in which the city of Nanking or Nanjing is captured by the by the Japanese military. Uh, the Chinese military kind of uh, retreats from it. The civilian population is left behind, and the Japanese military engages in a brutal occupation of the city that kills hundreds of thousands of people in macabre and disturbing ways. Um, it, words cannot really describe it in a lot of ways. You have um, some kind of highlights or, or like the images that um, penetrate into the popular culture would be things like um, the, the, a, a, a beheading contest that was uh, publicized, though not, didn't, might not have happened, between two Japanese officers in which they competed to see who could behead the most people within a certain time period. And it was reported by the Japanese press. Um, you also have uh, you know, rampant sexual assault of uh, Japanese women, I mean, Chinese women by Japanese soldiers. Uh, you have the murder and, and, and mutilation of children, of women, pregnant women as well. Um, it's not just 200,000 people die. Um, it's theatrical in its violence. Um, and, and, and so uh, it kind of is a event that really emblem is emblematic of the violence of the Second Son of Japanese War. Um, as a consequence, there's massive human displacement, right? We talked at length about refugees in our previous unit, and that's happening all across China. China is struggling immensely as people flee uh, the brutal Japanese um, occupation, uh, despite the brutality of the war and the amount of people that die, um, you know, millions of people die as a consequence of the war. We don't even know the number, really. Um, the Chinese don't give up. Uh, and this really ties up the resources of Japan. Uh, Japan has to get, dedicate a massive amount of resources to fight the war in China, and this kind of like with the Ottoman Empire, the Japan being forced to allocate those resources in China means that they cannot allocate those resources in the Pacific. So as America begins to advance throughout the Pacific, something that prevents the Japanese from more adequately resisting the Americans is the fact that they cannot, they don't want to give up any more territory. Um, they don't want to give up any more territory to the Chinese. So they have to keep forces in China while trying to fight against the Americans. And keep in mind, America is one of the largest economies in the world, and Japan is one of the most populous countries in the world. So, I mean, sorry, China is. So China is fighting two of the most powerful countries in the world and by different metrics at this period of time. Um, and then also the desperation of the conflict further forces Japan to seek allies and at this point, Hitler's in power. Hitler's looking for people who disrupt the established global order. And so Japan is eventually forced to jo uh, join the Axis powers because of the desperation that comes out of this. Um, and our final element of expansion would be Japan's decision to t sign the Tripartite tack Pact and their eventual attack on Pearl Harbor. Okay? So their assault on China... And also the Manchurian crisis leads to progressive isolation and ostracization of Japan by the established global community. Okay. They are seeking state while well, in that isolation, they look for countries that would enable that expansion. Italy and Germany fit the bill in that regard. They both all both of those countries by 1937 are seeking a means to expand. And so Japan aligns with them in a lot of ways out of convenience. Um, what's really kind of important to note about Japan is that they do, a, they take a lot of actions. The Japanese empire take a lot of actions, actions that can be comparable to the Nazi and Nazi government in Germany, and the fascist government in Italy, but it's, it's not the same. Like it just isn't. Um, they're reactionary conservative, right? They both want to preserve a, 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 a cultural or social worldview. Um, but I hesitate to say that beyond them being like a militaristic conservative dictatorship, 
that they aren't fascist, they aren't fascists and they aren't Nazis in the same way. Like fascism to me is very specifically Italian. Uh, and we'll talk about that in class. We'll talk about that when we get to Italy. Well, why? Um, World War II begins in 39, France falls. When France falls, Japan seizes Indochina, which is what is modern day Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Um, and that decision, kind of more than anything, is kind of the nail in the coffin of US Japanese relations. Okay. So, what leads to the decision to attack uh, America? on December 7th, 1941 at Pearl Harbor is that the Japanese government throughout this period of time, like the CUP and the Ottoman Empire, has become increasingly militaristic, right? The state believes that war is the only answer to solve the plurality of Japan's problems. And by the time they seize Indochina, the Japanese government has begun to believe that the only answer to America is that conflict with them is an eventuality. It is a certainty that at some point America must be dealt with. And that expansion is the only way that, J that the Japanese military believes that they can eventually win the war in China specifically, right? Because it's such a drain on resources. Japan is now being cut off from oil because when they invaded France into China, um, the, uh, the America is like, we're not going to import export any more oil to you. And so there's a, a finite resource in Japan uh, that really is essential to modern militaries. Like you can't use your vehicles anymore. You can't use your trucks. You can't use your tanks. You can't use your airplanes. Your naval vessels also require oil. All of those things now are limited because of the American decision to bar oil from them. We'll talk about this more in the international response to uh, Japanese expansion in the next video. Um, and so Japan thinks we had to fight America eventually. If we're going to do that, we need to ensure that we will be strong enough to fight them when that time happens. And so they plan an attack on Pearl Harbor because that's where the U.S. fleet in the Pacific is stationed. If they can destroy or severely inhibit or impair, disable the American fleet in the Pacific, Japan can expand into all of these other territories that are possessed by European nations, like the Dutch East Indies, uh, Thailand, Burma, China, India to an extent, Australia. And, and the, if they can take control of all of this territory, They'll have access to enough resources to when America is back in fighting shape, uh, they can uh, actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with America. Um, and so they're going to the, the intent is to delay America for a t the time being and then to conquer everything else and then fight America. Now, they grossly underestimate um the American industri industrial capacity in some way. Uh, in some ways, they're actually realistic about like their capacity to win a war against America in the moment that they attack America. They say, we probably can't win this war. But also, they come to believe that America is going to fight a war with them anyway, right? Kind of goes back to the CUP, right? That Russia is going to fight a war with us anyway, so we might as well fight a war now, right? And so we will spend a lot of time especially when we get to World War II in, in like November, December, talking about how these are Japan in World War II and the Ottomans in World War I are very much two sides of the same coin. Um, and so Pearl Harbor goes in, they attack trying to expand, they cause World War II, and yada, yada, yada. Okay, because I know I went kind of long in this video. Yes, so um, our final video will be the shortest video because the international response to Japanese expansion was relatively ineffective. Um, and yeah, we'll talk about that in the next video that I will record tomorrow. See you then, guys. Bye.